What a stand being made by firefighters in Summit County today, fending off this fire which has burned within 250 feet of buildings. The Buffalo Mountain Fire forced the evacuation of more than 1,300 homes, but not a single one has been lost to the flames at this point. That 91-acre fire is being attacked from the air and from the ground, and about 1,100 homeowners are warily watching and waiting after being told they must prepare to evacuate if that fire shifts. The Mammoth Fire burning in Colorado continues to be the 416 north of Durango. More than 900 firefighters are working that incident down there. Today, the entire San Juan National Forest across nine counties was closed. That fire has burned more than 23,000 acres. After days of being told it was at 10% containment, firefighters updated that to 15% today. They were doing burnout operations today, so they go in and they set preemptive fires to eat up some of the fuel so that they can control those small fires before the main body of the fire gets there. Also, the 416, not a single home has been lost. A few of you asked next how that fire got its name. It's actually a fairly mundane story. The enormous San Juan National Forest is divided into these three districts, and the fire was the 416th incident of the year in the Columbine District, the middle part of the National Forest. Incidents could be anything from a false alarm to a small fire. Our next question comes from Stephen, wondering how wildfire containment numbers are calculated. Nearly the whole time the 416 fire has been reported on, Stephen said to us, there's been the statement that it is 10% contained. However, each day it is growing much larger. Clearly something is amiss here. Perhaps it is the definition of what contained really means. An excellent question, which we took to South Metro Fire. Containment is uh, usually determined by crews that are on scene, and, and the incident commander will get an assessment from the people who are actually on the front lines of the fire to determine what percentage of it is contained. And sometimes that might not be very scientific. It might just be a round number of what the firefighters are looking at. It's just humans that may, might look superhuman on the news at times out there doing their job, and, and they give it the best number that they can give it. Makes a lot of sense. So perhaps you saw that media outlets are reporting that this 416 fire is the fifth largest in Colorado history. I honestly have no idea where they are getting that, but it is not remotely true. What's happening down there is bad enough that it does not need to be exaggerated on the news. Here are the facts of how that fire truly compares to the worst in Colorado history. Shifting estimates peg the size of the 416 fire north of Durango at a bit more than 23,000 acres, think 35 square miles. That makes it Colorado's 18th largest fire in history. Bigger, but far less destructive than the devastating 2012 Waldo Canyon fire, which took out hundreds of homes in Colorado Springs. But in terms of sheer size, the 416 fire is less than half the acreage of the fifth largest in state history. That was the 2012 Last Chance fire, a grassland fire. It's less than third the size of a massive fire that burned just on the other side of Highway 550 in the San Juan National Forest back in 2002. Durango remembers the Missionary Ridge fire. It's the fourth largest in Colorado history at 71,000 acres. The third largest in state history, the 2012 High Park Fire, 87,000 acres. The second largest, the 2013 West Fork Complex of Fires. That burned 109,000 plus acres. And all pale in comparison to Colorado's largest recorded fire, the 2002 Hayman Fire, which burned 138,000 acres, or 215 square miles. Perhaps you noted three of Colorado's five largest recorded fires happened during the dry summers of 2012 and 2013. And in fact, Colorado's 20 largest fires on record have all happened since the year 2000. You can see the full list on the next Facebook page. When it rains, it pours. But at least when it rains, if you flood, there's insurance for that. When Denver Water's mains break and you flood, you are up a creek of their creation, and they do not have to make you whole financially, not even when it ruins your home for the second time. Here's Marshall Zellier. Downstairs is, is where much of the damage was done. This was a furnished basement. <laughs> this was all mud that they had to shovel out. You incur risk just by living in a city with water. That's what they told us. Doug Duggan is digging out of another mess. The same water main in the same location basically broke 
filled our house with water. Gravity is working against the Duggins. A Denver water main break on Sunday up here, close to Colorado and Yale, flowed one block into his home. And it's not the first time. You know, they say it's easier going through things a second time, but it's really just a lot worse. Because I've already, I already know exactly what's behind all these walls, because I saw them three years ago when they ripped all the drywall out and ripped all the floors up the last time. That's because this water rock wall is really another Denver water main break that Duggins dealt with in 2015. When this water pipe broke in 2015, um, we paid over $77,000 in cleanup and restoration for the home as well as $8,000 for personal belongings. Denver water will replace the walls and carpet and get the mold out and basically make your home a home again. And since this policy took effect in 1997, Denver water will also pay up to $8,000 dollars for damage to your personal property. It's early sort of in the process and, and we know this was of, of big concern to them and, and we'll work with them um, with their with their issues. Doug says 8,000 wasn't near enough three years ago. We had a loss of $30,000 at least down here alone. The way insurance works is if it's a flood from an outside source, they treat it like a flood flood and if you don't have flood insurance, they don't pay for things in the basement. They told us if we had any more claims in the next four years, they weren't going to renew our insurance. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. We'll follow what happens with their insurance. We directly asked Denver Water if they could commit to helping the Duggins family beyond the $8,000 for the stuff. It appears that might require lawyers to open Denver Water's wallet. The Democrats running for governor pledged to run a clean and positive campaign, but that pledge got in the way of winning, so the gloves came off. Politics guy Brandon Ritterman continues his series of truth tests, now looking at how Jared Polis and his allies are hitting back at Kerry Kennedy. Jared Polis didn't like the tone of an ad from a group called Teachers for Kennedy, which attacked him over his support of a pilot program for school vouchers years back. Vouchers are government money to help pay for kids to go to private school, and they're wildly unpopular with liberals. Now, Team Polis has two ads hitting back at Kennedy. The one on the left is from Polis' official campaign. The one on the right comes from the same kind of outside spending group that attacked Polis. And even though these two can't legally coordinate, Coordinate, they sure sing the same tune. Carrie said she would run a clean campaign. But she broke her word. What else will she break? I don't like negative campaigning. Really? Carrie Kennedy breaking her pledge. This is fair. Carrie Kennedy did sign a clean campaign pledge from the state Democratic Party. And in the pledge, she promises to, quote, encourage my supporters or volunteers to refrain from engaging in personal attacks or smears against the other Democrats in this primary race. It goes on to say, I understand that primary attacks are short sighted because I will need the support of the other candidates and their supporters to win a general election if I am the primary nominee. And and yet, her supporters did attack other Democrats in the race, and rather than denounce it, Kennedy defended that attack and falsely claimed that she didn't have the right to denounce it due to campaign finance laws. Team Polis has one more bone to pick about that attack. We are all Colorado teachers, and we are very disappointed by Kerry Kennedy's false attacks against Jared Polis. What that teacher just said is false on two points. First, it wasn't Carrie Kennedy who attacked Jared Polis. It was a group of her supporters who legally aren't allowed to work together with her to do said attacking. And second, that attack against Jared Polis wasn't false. He did, in fact, publicly support a small pilot program for school vouchers 15 years ago. The pro-Kennedy group didn't make that up. It's not false. They just left out some important context to make him seem like he's an all-around pro-voucher guy, which he's not. Polis has repeatedly voted against vouchers in Congress. They also left out the fact that Kennedy herself did lobbying work for a group that supported that same voucher pilot program. Bottom line, it's fair game for the Polis campaign and his allies to call out Kerry Kennedy for breaking the clean campaign pledge. She promised to call out her supporters if they got nasty, and she didn't. But you should also know Jared Polis also signed that very same pledge. Not only does his campaign throw some nasty right back at her, but they make a pair of false arguments to do it. Some might call that a smear, the kind of smear both these candidates promised they wouldn't allow in this race. With your truth test, I'm Brandon Ritterman. It's a sign of what? Wow. Next viewer, Jolene Burnish, saw it outside Lyons near the intersection of 36 and 66. Guessing a bunch of you have seen this. It's a high traffic area. So 
Pray tell, what is a four one lane bridge? Is this obvious and I just don't see it? I stared at this thing and I cannot figure it out. Smart people, email me, explain it to me. What is a four one lane bridge? Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag hey next. I think every town in Colorado should have one of these. And some men and women like the good ones of North Glen hauled into a burning car to save a life. And Denver is overrun with cats and they're watching us. Next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a beautiful mural freshly painted on a grain bin in Lyman where you can see the beauty of the eastern plains in the people painted on that grain bin. The town commissioned the work by three artists from the area who called themselves Some Girls in a Mural. Isn't that spectacular? If you're a fan of the HBO, HBO show The Leftovers like I am, that'll remind you of the opening sequence. It's just gorgeous. And the mural is positioned right near I-70, strategically placed to invite people to pull off the interstate and visit Lyman. <laughs> My favorite picture of the day. Our weather picture is changing 87 degrees this afternoon, some 90s in southeastern Colorado and out across the western slope. We're dealing with about six wildfires across the state and temperatures are starting to ramp up. We are going to see those numbers continue to climb back into the 90s by tomorrow afternoon. So a fire weather watch and a red flag warning out eastern Utah and across the western slope. But some relief on the way by the weekend from a hurricane. It's going to hit Cabo San Lucas on Thursday, but could bring rain into western Colorado by Saturday and potentially into Denver and the Front Range by early next week, along with some more cooler weather, which would be nice. Tracking severe weather south of Trinidad, a couple of high base storms have just popped up outside of Kiowa and Callahan. Our most recent system tracking away and with high pressure anchored here, it is going to be another warm, dry spell for us. 58 hazy tonight. Tomorrow, back to the 90s we go. 92, a couple of high base gusty storms. Similar forecast getting you through Thursday and Friday, then a cooling trend. Good chance of rain rain from storm Sunday into Monday, so nice little treat for dad there. Some beneficial moisture for our state and highs in the 70s will feel terrific after this long stretch. What doesn't feel terrific? Uh, well, the allergies. You're probably suffering from weeds and trees, Kyle. Pretty tough out there today. Kathy, thanks. This next story is not about somebody who's drawn a taxpayer funded paycheck and did something wrong. Now, this next story is about a public servant doing the right thing like 99% of them do every single day without getting noticed on the news. They are the good ones. And they're almost all good ones. North Glen police recognized four of their good ones today for risking their lives to save a man from a burning car. Officers Lindsey Quiser, Chad Reffel, Patrick Toll, and Ibrahim Yassin responded to a car crash back in March. It was a nasty rollover off I-25. There's a guy pinned inside the car. He could not make it out on his own, and it was catching fire. The officers used a fire extinguisher and crawled inside to get him out before it ignited. Today, that man was able to personally thank them. It struck me that there was no luck involved in this. What struck me was that training, professionalism, commitment, and bravery all played their role in pulling me out of that car when I was trapped. And how fortunate we all are to live in a state like Colorado where we have such brave people who can help us when we're in trouble, and thank you so much for that. Boy, Bill's good with words. We should have him on here. Officers said that they were humbled. They're just glad that Bill made it. They are good ones indeed. Denver has a question. Like, how do you get people to walk through an alley? The answer, cats. Our Jeremy Hohola needs to tell you something about the scooters taking over this city. And who says we don't get close to our neighbors anymore? That's next. Denver has hundreds of new alley cats near Larimer Square. The cats are a new work of art. We met the artist, Kelly Monaco. We probably won't get all of them, all these up today. I do like cats. I'm a dog person. How do you get people to walk through an alley? What we're about to do is um, clear coat. We hope to install about 70 cats today. Once you realize they're there and you start looking, it, there's this sort of underlying feeling that you're being watched. The intention is to make, to sort of integrate all of it into the architecture. All of them will be painted uh, to match like whatever their surroundings are so that it 
kind of feels natural. I think cats are really interesting because they are these crazy acrobatic animals that can do amazing things like flips and mow lawns and because <laughs> YouTube told me so. She is my wife. She's done some site specific projects but nothing quite like this. If it can make people feel a little uncomfortable that's that's a, a great piece of artwork. A lot of the people that work in these buildings um, have been pretty hilarious. They're like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Yeah. I'm so happy to come to work today. These cats are like ridiculously kitschy and kind of cute, um, a little zombie-like, which I like. I hope people see this and are curious. And for the cat lovers, I think this is right up their alley. <laughs> And for the non-cat lovers, I think that if you can get any kind of emotion, it's a good thing. So anytime you get a rise out of somebody, good or bad, it's a good thing. All the dog people are like, we want dogs, we want dogs. Anytime you get a rise out of somebody, that's a good thing. Endorse. If all those cats staring at you, not creepy enough, they're also piping in cat sounds to the alley. Five alley art projects being installed now. They stay up through next May. The city of Denver is fighting the scooter invasion. Our Jeremy Hohola wonders whether resistance is futile. They invaded the city of Denver without permission and just dumped hundreds of these scooters all over town. One of my Twitter followers called it expensive litter. And I've seen tons of people break the rules with these things. They're running red lights, they're blocking the sidewalks. I've seen some people allow their kids to joyride these things without helmets. Yes. They're a pain in the asphalt. <laughs> yes, they're annoying, but hold on for a second. They're fun, and they're a cheap, affordable way to get through the city without having to drive and burn gas. Sure, these companies can be seen as jerks coming in and disrupting the urban landscape unannounced. They're breaking the rules, forcing the city to deal with them, but it doesn't appear they're going away. So maybe it's time to scoot over, make some room, and make a deal. City officials are constantly claiming they want cheaper, greener, alternative transportation. And you hear people complain about Denver's traffic problem all the time. If Denver's government can figure out a way to properly regulate this new industry while making sure users keep the sidewalks clear, it could be a win for everyone. People, the lines are not a suggestion. You're supposed to put your car between them. You've crossed a line. We've all been where Karen Jolly was the other day in Lakewood. Come out to find that somebody's getting close, real close. <laughs> she says she had to climb over her passenger side. How'd that song go? Sometimes when we touch, the honesty's too much. And I have to close my eyes and hide. Don't hide when you want to tell somebody they've crossed the line. Send the photo to us. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Everybody is certain they have solved the four one-lane bridge sign. Bill writes, geez, Kyle, there are four one-lane bridges ahead. Yet Denise says it means a bridge with two lanes going in each direction with a solid white line between them for no passing. Michael says four is a golf warning. Jude says four one-lane bridge or four lanes running in one direction. Pop says maybe it just needs an S. I think it might just need an S. Glad everybody's so certain of their solutions. We'll see you next time.